Good morning, C3. I'm going to miss that. I might have to turn it on every once in a while. I need to get ramped up for my day. Coffee's good, but I think that might be better. Um, good morning, C3. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Heather. I am Pastor Jean's wife, and I take care of a lot of the administration here at the church. I'm also in training for counseling through the School of Theology. And uh, to be honest with you, it's been an interesting seven years. I have been on the board with a couple of lead pastors at this point, and now the third, Jean being my husband. And uh, I thought I knew what it was like to be a lead pastor for the most part, you know, the struggles, all the things that go on behind scenes. But this video is going to clarify for you the other 30% that I really didn't know until I had a lead pastor in my home. So, roll it. He won't be stopped. We've got to keep that momentum. He keeps bouncing off. This is not a good sign. He's still on the first row. He started for the second row. Go get him, Mike! Absolutely extraordinary speech. He's got to be exhausted. He's on to the last row. Oh, had a little trouble, but break today. Hits it. Head up. He's got 20 seconds. Two are timing. Oh, but gets it to come down. Hits that one. Oh, he looks a little dizzy. He's a little woozy after that one. Come on, Mike. One more time, baby. The human body can only take so much. Oh, and he takes out two at once. I have never seen anything like that before. Hits one pane of glass so brutally hard. He wants it from the people. Oh, no. The final pain. It might be too much. Third attempt is a no-go. I think he's had enough. Oh, so please pray for your pastors and their family. I didn't understand the other 30%, which was about as much as the 70% I thought that I knew. So yes, and the commentary matched perfectly. I saw that last week. I was like, oh, I have to show this. It's hilarious. <laughs> uh, so this morning, we're in our 11th and final part of our Jesus League series. We have spent 10 weeks discussing the men of the New Testament. And if any of you have been here, you know I like to talk about the women in the Bible. So the, although we've talked about what the men did, who they were, what they wrote, today we're going to discuss the women of the Jesus League. Yes, there were some women in the Je Jesus League. And so you're aware, most of you know already, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian, but as I mentioned before in a couple of my messages, that I do have a history degree, I used to teach history, and I have been asked or voluntold by some of the pastors here to uh, take on the historical perspective of the Bible from time to time a few times a year. So... I am up here for the third time this year, and who knows what will happen next year. All right, so growing up, like I said last time, I think I give a lot of the parallels of what it's like growing up as a boy and a girl, at least in my generation, and those before me. Boys had all kinds of superheroes. They had Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, Thor, on and on and on. Now, Gene wanted to be Spider-Man, ended up more like Doctor Strange. <laughs> He gave me that joke, so I'm okay. <laughs> but as a girl, you had way less to choose from. For example, I had Wonder Woman, woman kind of why I also chose the C3 Wonder Woman, but mostly because most of the women in superhero shows were the villain. There was the cat lady, no, I mean the cat woman. No one really wants to be the cat lady. Uh, for, for me, we had the live show action uh, Wonder Woman show, which was so much fun to watch, the original. Uh, but our choices were few and far between, much like I mentioned as a little girl, you didn't really have the dream of becoming president when you grew up. So, luckily now there are more superheroes as women to choose from. We've got Black Widow and Captain Marvel, who apparently has all of the superhero supernova powers. If you haven't seen the movies, I have a 14-year-old totally obsessed, so I have to know it whether I want to or not. And um, so I've looked at it, and it's perhaps quality, not quantity, over the female superheroes. But I was talking to Sophie about this last week. We're having dinner. And going through and she's trying to name all the different women she's like no there's got to be more but none of them are really the leads but it doesn't diminish their point their part and abilities in what they're doing in the story so then she also made the point she's like oh maybe because girls have princesses kind of an interesting line now i think girls are kind of moving out of not wanting to be the princess and more wanting to be the superhero so less damsels in distress but kind of an interesting perspective that i got so this is how the jesus league is also 
There are many more men to look toward as examples and far fewer women, but again, it doesn't diminish their role and importance in the story. And this has been a great series, I think so anyway, and I've been really happy that we did it, mostly because I had been asking for this for several years. <laughs> so please do this. Um, when I first came to church about seven years ago, I really had no idea who these people were. Honestly, I didn't even know that they were historical characters. I really, you know, coming from my background, it was all very new to me. I didn't know that Mark, Luke, John, I didn't know that these were real people that followed Jesus. I knew that Jesus was a real life historical character, but really none of the background. And so we'd be in a whole series on Galatians, like 10 to 12 weeks. And I really had no idea who Paul was, why he was writing a letter, that he was even writing the letter, and that it was to a place, Galatia, where the people lived. No clue. I just heard a lot about circumcision, went, cringed a lot, had no idea what it was all about. So, um, so I sat and nodded and smiled and kind of tried to make it look like I knew what was going on. But as time went on, I spoke to more and more new believers, and honestly, even some long-time believers. The same held true for them that certain details that may seem obvious to some were not entirely for others. So the historian and teacher inside of me thought, hey, might be a good idea to teach people, everyone, who these people were and bring them to life so we have a better idea of what's going on in the New Testament. To be honest, I didn't even know that Ephesians, Philippians, and Galatians were all letters to people in places, Ephesus, Philippi, and Galatia. So admittedly, I have even witnessed a pastor who couldn't even name the 12 apostles. There are some out there who even think Jesus wrote some of the books in the Bible. Now, they're not to be blamed or even to be laughed at for not even for assuming something like that. Honestly, if you've never been taught any of these details, how are you supposed to know? We're not theologians, we're not pastors, and really, unless you're in it like a lead pastor or someone who reads all day, like Gene, his book, Aholicism, uh, digging in deeper, we really only get what we get on a Sunday or maybe a Bible study. You know, what's, we're luckily, we have stuff on the internet, but for the most part, if we're not in it, we generally don't know if we aren't taught. So I was one of those people sitting and nodding in my head so other people thought I knew what was going on. But honestly, I was really lost and too afraid to ask for any clarification. And so honestly, we used to have like bulletins and had a notes on the back before smartphones got even smarter. And if the sermon got too long, it eventually turned into my grocery list. And so they'd be like, Jean turns water into wine, okay? And before I stopped drinking, wine, I need wine. Oh, I think I need bread too eggs, milk. Oh, that's right. Okay, we're in Matthew 18. Oh, I have to forgive that person, but I need to make sure I bring a gift to their house, you know, so, and as the sermon got longer and longer, so did my grocery list, and then I try and have to remember to bring it with me and not leave it on the seat so no one saw my mixed notes slash grocery list, and I didn't forget what I needed at the store. So, honestly, we don't want that for you here, which is why next week, I mentioned it in my announcements last week, Jean is going to take questions from all of you. No one is going to ask or tell you who asked, or anyone is going to say who asked it. I know if you call into a radio show, they're like, Neil Daris would like to know, you know, like, or so small here, everyone kind of knows who everyone is. So it is completely anonymous. You can send in your questions. Gene will answer as many as he can and or at the Bible study. We'll make sure that they get answered at one point or another. But don't be afraid to ask. It is okay. Again, we're not pastors. We're not theologians. Not everything is always obvious. And if you're not new, or you are new, and you don't know, please don't be shy. We want you to ask away. Believe you me, Gene loves finding answers to these questions, so give them to him. And then, um, and mostly because we want you to feel a part of the story, not apart from the story. We really want you to connect and be a part of it, because nothing harder than reading the love letter from God and not really understanding what it is he's saying to you. So we want you to be a part of the story. And the more you can relate to any of these individuals, the easier it will be to follow any of their footsteps and understand the story so you can follow along and not get bored or lost during long sermons, which then lead to, like I said, for creating a grocery list, checking the stats of your favorite sports team, creating your fantasy football league, or if it's March, following March Madness. There are lots and lots of distractions in the outside world when you cannot connect to a message on a Sunday. And I know I can be guilty of that myself. So we want you to be able to connect in here and not get distracted and be able to fully engage. So purpose of having a series like this was to help create that context for you, of those in the New Testament, how they work together. And so to explain to you in context, not everyone knows the definition, so here the teacher in me is going to give you the definition. This is the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea, and in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed. 
So last week, Gene talked about importance of knowing the background. He talked about false teaching and understanding the background, which is so important because without it, you can make the story of scripture about anything you want it to. We call it cherry picking. So you can kind of take different scripture and take it out of context. And Dr. Ben Worthington III, hopefully he didn't have a son to name him the fourth, uh, a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. We were joking about this idea of that cherry picking of scripture. Like imagine if you took a fairy tale like Cinderella and cherry picked the story, you could end up flipping the whole thing around, making her stepmother seem like the hero. And she really just ran away from someone who took care of her for a whole life after she lost her father. So same type of thing. If you cherry pick and you don't understand the context, you can kind of make the story whatever you want it to. So it's really important. I think we have the rule 20, 20. You read 20 scriptures before and 20 after to really truly understand what that one line means. So that's what we hope to accomplish with you in here. So we've used the example before of watching the Justice League or the Avengers movies. I use a lot of superhero analogies. Like I said, I have no choice. I have a 14 year old who's obsessed. So uh, without watching the background stories of each hero, they are great movies. You get the point, but you miss a lot of the details in order for the whole story to make sense. So we rented Endgame again, it's what, three and a half hours? I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> so we just watched it about a week ago. And honestly, the movie progressed and part of it required them going back in time. They pulled parts from other movies and various heroes. And you really had to understand the other parts of their history to, in previous movies to fully understand what's going on in Endgame to appreciate what's happening and how it all comes together in the end much like in the Bible. So if you don't understand who the players are, their history, it doesn't make sense how it all comes together when you get to Acts and trying to make it actually work in real life. So I don't know about you, but when I watch these movies, I always attach myself to one of the characters. So we wanted to be able to do that with you in the New Testament with the Jesus League members, not only to understand how it all tied together, but also to be able to identify yourself with one of the characters in the story in the Bible and to be able to put ourselves in their shoes and then follow their examples. So Paul tells us the Philippians to, shop, to follow the examples they see in Timothy and him. In Philippians 3.17, Brothers and sisters, become imitators of me and watch those who live this way. You can use us as models. So today we're going to look at the women of the Jesus League. These women represented the first witnesses to the empty tomb, the first convert in Europe, and business people, just to name a few. They may not have written any of the New Testament, but some delivered it. So we're going to go back in time again and look at the women in the Bible. When I was up here last at the end of the Mark series, I seem to be the uh, one tie the bow on all the end of the series, lucky me, finished Mark series and now the Jesus League. Um, I spoke about the women as witnesses in the tomb and conveyed to you all just how monumental it was that women were witnesses of the tomb when they weren't even allowed to be witnesses in court of law. Jesus chose them to be witnesses to the event of the cornerstone of Christianity and the empty tomb of our resurrected Savior. Jesus turned the world upside down with his teachings and his return, using the least of these and making those who would be considered uncredible witnesses to the most critical and important witnesses in the creation of Christianity. The men had mostly fled, and as Jean talked about, Peter recently having denied Jesus three times the least of these, he still ended up becoming the head apostle regardless. So the Bible is unique as it pertains to the role of women throughout. Not as much in the Old Testament, but we still have a few examples. In Judges 4.4, we have Deborah, a strong woman of her time. Deborah, a woman who was a prophetess and the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. It was her custom to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her for judgment. So she was a judge to the Israelites. We also have the example of the Proverbs 31 woman, pretty famous for her time. She evaluates a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard with her earnings. She draws on her strength and reveals that her arms are strong. She sees that her profits are good and her lamp never goes out at night. She makes her own bed coverings and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the city gates where he sits among the elders of the land. She makes and sells linen garments. She delivers belts to the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she can laugh at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and loving instruction is on her tongue. This was a woman, as it seems, now ahead of her time. She was a success successful businesswoman in charge of the household, strong in both body and spirit. She is very busy, even working late into the night, and trusted with all of these responsibilities, including purchasing real estate, with the money that she made, 
evaluating the land for its value in her future business dealings, all while her husband sits among the elders. Now I think she would fit right in with the modern working woman balancing a full-time job, laundry, cooking, cleaning, car lines, helping with homework, paying bills, just to name a few. Makes me exhausted just saying that sentence. Um, all with strength and honor and a loving manner in which she speaks to people. She probably doesn't swear at people in car line. I'm still working on that. <laughs> I think she may actually be the original Wonder Woman. So now we're going to go to the book of Acts, which is a history of the early church. And after the Gospels, where the women discovered the empty tomb, we now see the women in their early role in the early church. Much like the Proverbs 31 woman, we have a real-life New Testament example of Lydia, a merchant and the first convert in Europe. And that is a pretty strong role, being the first European convert and being so strong in the faith that her entire household all then converted as well. We read about it in Acts, Acts 16.11. We sailed from Troas straight for Samothrace and came to Neapolis the following day. From there, we went to Philippi, a city of Macedonia's first district and a Roman colony. We stayed in that city several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the riverbank where we thought there might be a place for prayer. We sat down and began to talk with the women who had, who had gathered. One of those women was Lydia, a Gentile god worshiper from the city of Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth. As she listened, the Lord enabled her to embrace Paul's message. Once she and her household were baptized, she urged, now that you have decided I'm a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house, and she persuaded us. So Lydia and the Proverbs 31 woman were unique in the ability to make purple linen. You're probably thinking, what is the big deal about her making purple linen? We have every color under the rainbow in clothing now. Why does it even matter to mention her profession in purple linen? That variety of color did not exist so much back then, and in order to create this purple dye, they had to gather tens of thousands of murex shellfish. I think we have a picture. Yeah, those, and they come in like, actually like a cream color, not always in purple. They boil them, tens of thousands of them, to have them secrete the dye, even just to make a little bit of it, so that they can do any shade of royal purple to reddish scarlet. This dye being so expensive was usually only afforded by royalty or the wealthy which is why we have the name royal purple or even royal blue. The colors worn by the elite given the color that name as well as they, they, they were the only ones who could actually afford to buy this dyed clothing. The profession was so profitable that murex shellfish became worth their weight in gold. So she is a woman managing such an enterprise of dyed clothing that they are merchants to the elite. This allows Lydia to be the benefactor and host to Paul she was a successful woman in her time and owning her own home. She had servants. We don't know if she had a husband. We don't know if she was widowed or unmarried, as it was not mentioned. But without a husband mentioned, it is very unique to find a woman this successful on her own. Even if she was married, it would have been remarkable that she would have been the one to influence her husband and family to getting baptized. And equally remarkable that if she wasn't married, then that she would have been the spiritual head of the household and also in charge of it. She is a great example, although she was a very successful businesswoman, her heart was not consumed by her wealth and her business. Her mind and heart became centered to God, and she was able to afford the opportunity of her wealth to be of service to the roots of Christianity and a servant of Christ. So now we're going to move on to some other women mentioned in Acts. First, Priscilla. Acts 18.24. A Jew named Apollos a native Alexandrian and eloquent man who was powerful in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught the things about Jesus accurately. Although he knew only John's baptism, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him home and explained the way of God to him more accurately. He wanted to cross over to Achaia. The brothers wrote to the disciples, urging them to welcome him. After he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. So did you notice that Priscilla's name was listed first? Even today, when we list a husband and his wife's name, we list the man's name first. Wedding invitations, as an example, Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. You generally don't include the woman's name. So it would have been radically different back then that a woman was listed first, much less that she was also teaching a man of Paulus and clarifying the teaching of Jesus. Priscilla, or Prissa, is also mentioned again in the next book of the Bible, Romans, in chapter 16. And again, she is listed first. Romans 16, 3. 
Give my greetings to Prisca and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but do all the Gentile churches. Greet also the church that meets in their home. Prior to that, Paul mentions Phoebe. Most of you may have heard of her but at this point, but she was a deaconess who was given the responsibility of delivering the letter of, to Rome, we now call Romans. It could be said that we may not have that letter if it wasn't for Phoebe being the one to handle and deliver it to its rightful destination. So in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, it says, I commend you, our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church of Sencrea. That's a fun word to say. <laughs> So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever manner she may require your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor of many and of me also. Now, it's interesting to note here that Phoebe would have been sent with instructions about her letter and its content and to explain it for any of those who needed more clarification. That is an enormous responsibility, being sent to deliver and explain the letter of Romans. I don't think I'd want that role of explaining the letter of Romans to anyone. I'm still trying to understand it myself. Uh, in the same chapter, we also see Mary and a woman named Junia, who is noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles. Romans 16.6, 6, greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen and fellow prisoners. They are noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles, and they were also in Christ before me, meaning they got baptized before Paul. The history on Phoebe must be verified by an early church father letter, and we have deaconesses in history. Now, I didn't choose to read this entire letter all over again because Jean already had mentioned it previously. It is a letter from Pliny the Younger to governor of Pontus the Emperor in uh, Trajan in about 110, 111 AD. Now, this letter, he's writing for clarification. He's supposed to root out all of the Christians and figure out who's actually still practicing. Jean explained to you that if they were professing to an idol and were allowed, if they lied or were able to actually pray to not their God, they knew they weren't in fact actually Christians. So those who were Christians couldn't be forced to do that. And what was so troubling to him, which is why he wrote this letter, is the numbers in which there were Christians. They didn't realize how rampant the religion had gotten. They said, what do I do? We have old and young and women and children. If we kill and execute all of these people, it's going to have a detriment on the population. Like once he started really researching how many Christians they were, he's writing like, uh, do I actually kill all these people? Because it's going to have a huge dent. So in this letter, he recognizes that there are deacons. Accordingly, I judged it all more necessary to find out that the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. So through this letter, we can see from a third party historian, someone who has no benefit or gain about looking at or speculating in Christians, that there were in fact women who held the position of deaconess. And if you remember in the chart that Jean showed you last week, a deacon is one of the three appointments of leadership in the church that women filled as well as men. And another interesting note to take on them being deaconesses is that they were slaves in the world. So we have female slaves who then become leaders as deaconesses in the Christian church. Going along with that theme where I showed you before, women being the witnesses of Christ who were not witnesses in the world. He's turning everything upside down. So you have slaves who are now leaders in a church. It's unheard of in its time and kind of still is in some places today. So overall, not many women are mentioned, but those who are serve unique and high-level roles. Much like I explained about the women as witnesses in the tomb, Christianity turned everything upside down. Even Luke's reference to the empty tomb, he stated there were many women at the tomb in addition to the three that he named. So women tended to be converts faster than men during that time, partially because of the whole circumcision thing. Uh, but in general, it gave them a place to find purpose through Christ where they may not have had one before him. So honestly, what do we do with all this? We had 11 weeks, multiple members of the Jesus League. Now, I would encourage you, perhaps watch it again. All of the 11 messages are probably not as long as Endgame and will you know, give you a lot more information you can use in your life other than who all the superheroes were because then you have to watch all the old ones too. It's more complicated. So <clears throat> I would encourage you to look at the early followers of Christ and ask yourself, who do you relate to most? I honestly don't think it was a coincidence that there was such a large variety of personalities in the Jesus League. You have a range from a Pharisee turned Christian, a doctor, a fisherman, a tax collector, young men who had no professions, business women, and high levels and prominent members in society. What's interesting, too, is when you look at this variety, not only were there many players to help spread Christianity then, it translates to us now. 
So just like we have doctors in different levels, maybe we don't have as many fishermen, but you find all the different roles. So there's somebody in the Jesus League that you can relate to, whether it's their profession, their personality, their roots, their background, wherever they came from. So for me, Galatians 3.27 sums this up. All of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's no, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So it literally levels the playing field with everyone to be considerate of one another, no matter who they are. There is no rank. There is no nothing. We are just people who love each other. So it sheds off what the world has given us as labels and makes us one in the same in Christ. <clears throat> and what's interesting is life and all that it brings, both good and bad, does not discriminate. And you know what? Luckily, neither does Jesus. We are all one in the same in him. We still have the world and all that it throws at us. We now have technology. The way we do things is different. How quickly we communicate. Those all need to be different now from what it was about 2,000 years ago. But honestly, if you look at the stories back then, human nature and the personalities of people and the infancy in Christ are really all the same as they are today. So now that we have the background stories, we know the people, who they were, what they wrote, what they did, we have gained a new dynamic view of the New Testament, understanding the people that were there and trying to put ourselves in their shoes or sandals and follow their examples as life and human nature really wasn't all that different than it is today. Much like when you watch the movies and relate yourself to a character, perhaps now you'll be able to do the same with one of those in the Jesus League. Next week, as I mentioned before, we have a unique standalone message where Jean will answer various questions that were sent in by you and answer them. And please, as I said before, do not be afraid. You are not required to know everything, and if you are confused or need clarification, send in your questions. Please do not wait as long as I did. I just had someone at home that kind of clarified it for me, so I had no choice. It eventually came to me. Um, <clears throat> so now that we have our contacts, we're ready for our new series, Those Crazy Corinthians. You probably got the email over the past couple weeks. Um, Those Crazy Corinthians, are we any different? And yes, now I know it's a place called Corinth. <laughs> we know about Paul, Titus, and Timothy who appear in that series. Now we know who they were and what they did, which will give us clarity and bring the story to life. It will make so much more sense for us. And now that we have the background stories, we can fully understand and dig in deeper about what's going to be discussed through the series. Now, I have my choice characters of people I look for, for examples. Do you have yours? If not, I encourage you to look back and pick one. Our next series is going to challenge us. Are we any different? The Corinthians seemed crazy, but are we any different now? Well, we'll certainly find out. Thanks. <music>